It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. The hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? I'm proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who win. Buckeye Podcast, by fans, for the fans, where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OH! Oh, welcome back to the OHIO Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Boggs. That man over there is the wild man, Chris Wilds. He's tuckered out. He's had a long day, long weekend, pushing jerseys out of flea market. And if you're like me, you've had a long week of watching draft picks. That's what I've been doing the last few days. And if you're a Browns fan, you're pretty happy because you came away with a bunch of Browns, just like this man over here. Seems to be that smiles from ear to ear because he's a Brownies fan. And my Bungles, we came away with zero, none. It's been a long time since we haven't uh, drafted a Buckeye. So, uh, Chris, how you doing this weekend? Like you said, Eric, I'm tired. I'm worn out. But, uh, hey, like you said, watched a little bit of draft uh, football and uh, ready to talk a little bit of Buckeyes. And uh, what more can I ask for to wrap up the weekend, right? There you go. Larry Daniels, our listener from Florida. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Larry. Good to have you with us. Our buddy Ryan Wickerham. What up, my guys? Good to see you tonight, Ryan. Welcome back into the OHIO podcast. And, and Chris, I want to give a special thank shout out tonight um i got a really cool message and i'm not going to read the message it was uh i I read it to you chris but a shout out tonight to donald rogers uh, scott's father Uh, scott's got him listening to uh our podcast and uh he uh he seems to like it keeps listening to us so hey we'll take as many of you buckeye fans as we can uh welcome into the ohio podcast donald hope i get to meet you someday in person my friend uh, so tonight, the show is dedicated to you, my friend. Uh, Chris, we got a lot to get into tonight. We want a lot of you listener feedback with us. We've got a very special guest going to join us tonight, former Ohio State Buckeye. Uh, uh, Steve Belisari is going to be with us tonight. So uh, he was a lefty quarterback, yep. just like our future quarterback, Air Noland, is a lefty. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask him some of those questions. Um, but we always love having former Buckeyes join us live, and hopefully that feed goes well and everything goes well with that tonight. But our first topic tonight, Chris, we're going to play a little game. We're going to play like it, don't like it, with the Ohio State Buckeyes who were drafted. Okay. And here's how this goes. I'm basically going to give you the pick, uh, the player, the pick, where he went, the team he went to, and you tell me if you like it or don't like it, from the perspective of the player and us as Buckeye fans, okay? That's kind of the rules for this game tonight. And so let's get started with the the biggest one, man. Round one, pick number two. little surprise he went to pick number two to the Houston Texans quarterback, C.J. Stroud. Chris, like it, don't like it? You know, I think he would have been better if he'd slipped about two spots. Although I will say this, the Texans have done a great job. They've got a good running back in uh, uh, Damian Pierce. They have, they've solidified that offensive line a little bit. Uh, you know, they got Laramie Tunsil down there at the uh, the one tackle. Uh, I, I, the name of the other slips my mind right now, but you know they've improved that offensive line. Um, I really like what D'Amico Ryan's is putting together down there, and 
the fact that they went out, I, I honestly think CJ would have preferred maybe if that three might have been spent on a, say, a high quality receiver that maybe he had a little bit of familiarity with. But uh, mm-hmm. you know what? I really think that they did a great job uh, offensively and defensively drafting. And, you know, this is a team that I think is going to be in a position to turn a lot of things around. Okay. So, so sounds yeah, like I, you think, like I it. think it's a. I think it's a positive move for CJ and hey, the uh, the, the second uh, pick in the draft does get paid more than the fourth pick in the draft. So, <laughs> sure, I'm sure he likes that. Um, I I like it as well. I think that Houston is a team that um, they're turning things around. I don't like it for the first year or two. I think this is going to be very similar to what we've seen with Justin Fields that there's going to be um, – hopefully he doesn't get destroyed. He like has this. a better line than what Justin does. Yes. I, yeah, and I think that's big. And, Eric, I think the other thing is expectations aren't going to be as high given where the Texans have been at since uh, Deshaun Watson's exodus. Okay. I think – I'm with you. I think if he just slipped the four and went to Indy, it's maybe a little bit better of a situation. It's a better organization. Than what Houston's got. But um, – no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not terribly upset. I'm very happy for him, and so I'm going to say like it. All right, let's go on to the next pick, and this one surprised me as well. How how fast he went? Paris Johnson Jr., the big offensive tackle. He was the first tackle off the board, round one, pick number six, to the Arizona Cardinals. Chris, do you like it? Don't like it. I like it for him. Uh, the reason being, a uh, if I'm not mistaken, his father played at uh, with the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, so there's a little bit of a uh, nostalgia uh, there with him playing there. I think it's a, a, again, I think that they've got some quality pieces and I think that the expectations are not going to be tremendously high. Uh, however, I do feel that he's going to have to be ready to step in and play day one. Uh, I You draft somebody at six as an offensive tackle, you're expecting them to go out there and start right now. So while the team's expectations may not be as high, I think the expectations are going to be very high on him. Uh, but I also think that uh, Paris is a guy that can, you know, handle those expectations. However, I kind of worry about a little bit. He's going to face some pretty tough competition out there in the NFC West. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a certain defensive end out there in San Francisco. He might, who, uh, you know, might be giving just a few problems. So are you predicting a little Buckeye on Buckeye crime? I'm I'm seeing just a little bit of it. Yeah. Well, that's part of the success. When you have a lot of success like Ohio State has had and it recently, you're going to get you know those matchups where they're going to go up against each other uh, eventually. It's just what's going to happen. Just wait until you have multiple quarterbacks. In yeah. The league. Uh, and it's like, well, who are you going to root for there? Uh, pick number 20, the first round to the Seattle Seahawks, wide receiver Jackson Smith and the Jigba. Now, before I ask you if you like it or don't like it, let me just say this. I love this one. Oh, I do too. Uh, this was, for him, perhaps a the best situation that he could have gotten into. Uh, I think he's going to go in there. Obviously, th- this is almost like the Ohio State you know, you know, wide receiver room of the NFL now at this point. Because you've got D, uh, Metcalf on the one side. You've got Tyler Lockett on the other. That's going to mean uh, Smith and Jimmy can go in there and play the slot. Something that he's very comfortable with, uh, you know. So I really feel like he's going to have a lot of success. Geno Smith, if he has, if he can replicate the success of last year, uh, I mean, this is going to be a potent offense. You've got a good offensive line, a good quarterback, three great receivers. Uh, you got a great running game with uh, uh, the kid from Michigan State, the transfer uh, Kenneth Walker Jr. up there. Uh, Penny's still up there, I believe. Uh, this is a team that should be very explosive and be ready to contend in that NFC West. They are going to be very good. In fact, the experts were talking that that might be the early pick to win that division this upcoming year. And that's saying a yeah. lot because they're in the same division with San Francisco. Uh, to, to you know, comes to mind right away as the team that kind of you felt kind of had their way a little bit uh, yeah. in that division. So uh, the Rams, they're just two years removed from – Super Bowl. The Rams are in full blown rebuild though now, Eric. They I are. mean, the Rams. The Rams are. I mean, I feel bad for Matt Stafford at this point. Oh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but but I was glad to see him get his quarter, or got glad to see him get his ring. You're nicer than me. 
hated the fact that Odell got one, but you know, he, he got that ring over, uh, over my team, but, um, all right. Uh, wow. How about this man? Zach Harrison, uh, sneaks his way into day two round three, pick number 75 to the Atlanta Falcon. This one shocked me. Do you like it or don't like it? I like it for Zach Harrison. Um, I think that it's, it's a good situation. However, I do think that in looking at that defense in Atlanta, he's going to feel a lot of the pressures and expectations that he felt here at Ohio state. And I don't know whether some of that weighed on him his first few years here at Ohio state. And that's what led to, to maybe less than what we expected performance wise, not to say that he performed bad, but less than what we expected of him. And I feel he's going to be riding in now with those same types of expectations to Atlanta. Um, Again, I think it's going to be a good fit for him if everything works out. But I also feel that it could be a nightmare if things start to go sideways. Yeah, I don't like this. Um, I think he's going to be expected to play. And yes, and I just I don't know that that's going to set him up long term for success. I think he needs to go in and learn a little bit. Uh, yeah. From someone who maybe is a little bit longer in a tooth, but's got another, still got a year or two uh, before they can, you know, turn the reins over to him, per se. But this is a what have you done for me lately league, and yes. I think Atlanta will kind of moved up. I mean, if he's drafted fifth round, the expectations are different. But yes. being a third round pick, uh, I mean, you're I expected to at least contribute mm-hmm. first year. Mm-hmm. You may not be expected to start, but you're expected to contribute first year. Right. Um, all right, so then the the fall happened. I mean, no one saw this. Dewan Jones fell all the way to day three. Fourth pick, pick number or fourth round, pick 111 to your Cleveland Browns. Now I love and I know you're gonna love this. Um, but for Dwan, do you love it? Do you like it or not like it? I really love this uh, for Dewan as well. I think this is a good situation for Dwan. Um, you've got a good quarterback. You've got an established running game. Uh, you know, I think that he's a plug and play guy right now. It's not very often you get a plug and play guy at right tackle on the offensive line in, in the the fourth round, fifth round. That just doesn't happen. And Cleveland's got a guy, and they've got a t- pretty talented offensive line now which may give him a little bit of leeway to slowly ease in. But I think they got their tackle in the future and got him, in a, got him in a late round. And I think that's huge for him. I think it's going to be huge for the Browns. Um, Real quick, though, man, he it sounds like he fell because he, well, number one, he didn't participate in the pro day. He didn't of course. participate in the, um, over an Indy, uh, the NFL and the combine. combine. And rumors were that he's lot of, uh, put a lot of weight back on. Um, so if he shows up in Cleveland and he's not ready to go, uh, I worry about this for him. So um, we'll see. Uh, the only time will tell. Obviously, I'm different than you. I I, I don't like it for him I because I wanted to see him go down 71 south to Cincinnati and protect my boy on, on from the right side. So, well, what's scary to me is this is the guy. I, I predicted this kid to go at the end of the first round. You did. And I really did. thought that he would have been a great fit in Kansas City. Probably, but, but you know, I, I'm very happy I mean, that he Kansas City could have got him in the third round. I'm very happy that he wound up in Cleveland because I think he's got the potential to be awesome. Luke Whipler slips to the sixth round, pick number one ninety, also to your Cleveland Browns. Chris, do you love it? Or like it? Not like it? Uh, you know, I I love it for for Whipler as far as again they've got a established talented center in Cleveland right now, which means he doesn't have to go in and start. He can get up to speed with the NFL game. Uh, you know, he can he can get some playing time and not have to be pushed into a start right now situation. It gives him a chance to learn the playbook, learn the way the NFL is, learn the, the speed of the game at the NFL level. Uh, I think he's going to, again, I hated to see him drop this far because I think he was a much higher caliber player than this. I think he was somebody who, well, let's be honest, deserved that big payday. 
that would have come with being a couple rounds higher. Uh, but I think in the long run, it's going to be a good situation for him as far as his abil- ability to develop himself at the NFL level. Were you shocked that those were the only six Buckeyes drafted? Yes. Uh, I felt that Ronnie Hickman would get there. I thought somebody would give Cam Cam Brown, J- uh, Cam Brown a, a shot in the seventh, if nothing else. I really liked the idea of him going to Philadelphia in the seventh, to be honest. Um, I thought that was going to be a great fit for him. But I'll tell you, those guys over in Philly seem to be enamored with uh, the Georgia, Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah. Uh, they've got, I believe, what is it, six or seven Georgia Bulldog players on their defense now. Yeah, and then they traded for Swift. And they traded for Swift, joint. yeah. Yeah, they're trying to, I mean, at this point, the next football coach is <laughs> going to be Kirby Smart. Kirby Kirby Smart at this point. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I was I was shocked by that, uh, especially when you look at how many players were drafted from TTUN compared to us. I think that's telling. It is. I think that's I think that's very telling. Someone made a very good point that why should anybody in the NFL trust what's coming out of Ohio State's defensive backfield right now? And I was like, ooh, I can't disagree with them completely. Ouch. Yeah, that one that one hurt a little bit, but I can't disagree either. Uh, Luke Whipler, by the way, will be a starter in the NFL. Mark it down. Oh, he'll be a starter in the NFL, and I think this – but but I do like the fit of him going a little bit later in the draft to get a chance to develop because I think that's going to make him a a, a long-term starter in the NFL. Agreed, agreed. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> Next topic, depth chart. We're going to do the defense this week, Chris. Uh, let's go ahead and let's start with the defensive line first. Okay. Uh, let's let's do that. And um, I'm going to say, I think let's let's take the defensive end. It's JT Tumulau, Jack Sawyer. And I know I can't say JT last name proper anyways. Tumulau. Culture swine. JTT. I know his parents don't like that. He doesn't like that. But even Ryan Day calls him JTT. Um, then defensive tackles. I'm going with Mike Hull Jr. and Tyleek Williams. But I've heard people put Ty Hamilton there. Instead yes. of Tyleek, but I'm going with JTT, Jack Sawyer, Mike Hall, Tyleek Williams starting. Who do you got? Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I actually have those same four starters. Uh, you know, I think the argument has been made that maybe uh, Ty Hamilton play more of that nose tackle position, uh, and you have Tyleek and, and Mike Hall almost switching back and forth uh, to reduce the number of snaps that each is taking, but... I think both those guys are just too daggone explosive to not have them on the field at one time. And so then the second teamers would be Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson at mm-hmm. defensive end, Ty Hamilton or Tyleek Williams, if you flip flop them uh, at defensive tackle, along with Jaden McKenzie, McKenzie. At, mm-hmm. at defensive tackle as well. So that's my two deep. What you got, Chris? Same? Same ones, man. Beautiful. That's a beautiful thing when we agree. Why don't you do linebackers then? All right, well, for me, I mean, obviously you got uh, Steel Chambers and Tommy Two Thumbs back in there. No. The, uh, the linebackers starting. You, you think that's a pretty safe bet, Eric? Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like, uh, you know, Cody Simon backing up Tommy Two Thumbs and uh, C.J. Hicks probably backing up Steel. What it, who do you have at the um... – Let's see, because we we got the 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 Will and the Sam, and then what's the other linebacker position? The third one when Mike. we actually play the Mike, yeah. Um, who do you got, Cody Simon? You slide him in there as the third when we when we go up against the team with the running, or do you go with CJ? Well, I'll tell you, I like the experience of Cody Simon. But I think the youngster may just be too good to keep off the field. Mm. Um, gut instinct tells me that Ryan Day would, would would play Cody Simon first. Or Jim Knowles would play Cody Simon first. Um, at least get the first opportunity. But if it's not working well, I think he's got a very short string. Mm-hmm. What about... What about the stand-up defensive end slash linebacker, uh, the jack position? Uh, did you put anybody in there? I really did because I think we're going to see more, much more of the traditional 
I, I would say keep your eye on when we do go to this and we do play that Mitchell Melton. Mitchell Melton. Yeah. Jim Knowles has he just gushes over him uh, in that position. Of course, well, he's just a in, player too, Eric. I mean, he, he's a player. When he's healthy, he's just he's everywhere. Mm hmm. So that yeah, the, the, I agree with you completely. Now, let's go to let's go to cornerback because I think this is interesting here. I, I've got Denzel Burke and Davison Igbenosan as the starters, but I can be convinced of someone else. So, who you got? Boy, that's who I've got in there as well, Eric. Okay. But yeah, uh, you, you know they're. Do you think? Already, do you think? Lorenzo Styles Jr. That's that's popped in my mind a little bit. Yeah. Um, he, he did commit this weekend, so he did. I mean, if there's a possibility. I think he was brought in to compete. I really do. I do too. I um, have him currently, though, as my backup. I've got. As um, do I. I have as as the second string Lorenzo Styles Jr. and Jordan Hancock. Um, but you can't, uh, you can't, Jair Brown had a good spring. Yeah. So it's interesting to me after all of the, uh, let's just call it like it is the, um, the hate that that position was getting from Buckeye nation. Um, and what we just said about the defensive backs in the NFL, how that we used to be CBU and now we, they called themselves the BIA best in America. Yeah. And for four years now, we've just. Been crap. in that position. Oh, what it is? We've been crap. I feel like it's a, it's a position that all of a sudden it's looking like it's pretty deep. Believe it yeah. or not. Yeah, I agree. And they looked great in spring. They absolutely agree. Now, the one time they didn't look good was when they were guarding Marvin Harrison Jr. Nobody in the country looks good guarding Marvin Harrison Jr. Exactly. And why is that, Eric? Because he's the best in um in the country. Number one. Yes. Best in number America. one in the country. Absolutely. Hands down. Polish up the Heisman and just give it to him now. Whoa, my goodness. Yeah, so we just got a question. Let's answer this real quick before we move on to the to the uh safeties. Larry Daniels says, Any news on the portal? Yeah, we've got some news. Well, we just mentioned this weekend that Lorenzo Styles Jr., uh, who was a wide receiver at Notre Dame. He is the son, of course, to legendary Lorenzo Styles, uh, senior. Brother and, to Sonny. And he's the older brother of Sonny Styles, who's the, one of the safeties at Ohio State. He is uh, committed and signed. And then we also, Chris, uh, just got a commitment from the big offensive lineman from San, San Diego. Diego State. And, and let me look up his name real fast. Josh, uh, Josh Simons? Josh Simons. Yeah. Thank you. Now I don't know a lot about him yet, Larry. I'm I'm digging into it. I'm going to spend some time to figure out a little bit more about this guy. Um, to you know, but right now he's at least tackle depth that we needed. Uh, we just lost Ben Christman to the portal, mm -hmm. and we had no. And he was our. I think he was our first tackle off the bench, um, at least left tackle. And he's gone. And so now we've got someone coming in. Uh, we'll see what happens with the depth on that. Um, but we needed that bad. And I, I wouldn't be against us going out and getting another one if we can find it. Problem yeah. is, is it's slim pickings right now. So, uh, hey, Jason Monk's in the house. He says the big thing with the DBs not being so good over the last few seasons has a lot to do with the defensive front not getting to the quarterback. I agree. It goes yeah, hand in hand. He's not wrong. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, when 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 you've got Chase Young and you've got the Bosa uh, boys. The Bosa yeah. brothers getting to a quarterback in two seconds or less, that makes that makes your cornerback play really good. It means all you got to do is cover for two seconds. That's it. Um, so and we saw that this spring. You mm -hmm. and I were counting it. How fast yeah. was our defensive ends getting to the quarterback? And it was two seconds or less every snap. One of them was getting home. That doesn't mean that like Jack, you know, Jack Sawyer was doing it every single time. Maybe it was him once. Maybe it was 
one of the JT, defensive tackles yeah. next. Maybe it was JT on the third down. But they were getting to the quarterback and causing him to leave the pocket and and scramble in two seconds or less almost every single snap. Now, we came away from that being really down on the offensive line. But on the flip side of that is if the defensive line is that good, that makes everybody on the defense that much better, including the cornerback. It means the offensive line isn't as bad as we think. True, and which is kind of what I'm hoping. Yeah. That's what, how, that's what I get my fingers crossed about. All right, so let's move to safety now, Chris, as we took a little detour there to answer a couple questions. And, and I think this is the most interesting position really here. Yes. Which one do you want? Because you have free safety, you have strong safety, and you have the slot safety yeah. corner slash uh, whatever they're calling that, cowboy or something like that. Uh, which one do you want to do first? Uh, you know what? Let's uh, Let's start with the strong safety. Go for it. Uh, I think the strong safety probably gets Lathan Ransom in the starter um, and probably has Sonny Styles backing him up at number two. But I'll tell you what, I, you could convince me. You could convince me that Sonny Styles has earned his playing time. Let me convince because, you on how this, how this goes down. Yep. Here's how Sonny Styles is going to get on the field other than ro- being rotated in. Do you remember last year in the Notre Dame game on the very first drive what happened to Josh Proctor? Yep, he got he got beat and he was gone. Yanked him right. That was away. the last we saw of him pretty much for the year. Do you remember what happened to Lathan Ransom in the national championship game? When he fell down? Slip and fall. Yeah. Yep. If Lathan Ransom doesn't cover his crap quickly in this game, in in the in the opening games. Yeah, whoosh, he could get yanked fast because the guy behind him is coming on strong. Yes. So I agree with you right now. Strong safety. That's who I got. But I can be convinced that very quickly uh, that could all change in just a matter of a play or two. So, you know, we want to definitely keep an eye on that. Um, how about free safety? Uh, you know, <sighs> We, we talked about him just a few minutes ago, Josh Proctor. Uh, I think being a senior, he's going to get the opportunity to start. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like Kai Stokes is right there nipping at his heels as well. Yeah, I I agree with you completely. But here's the thing. like I, I like having that that oh gosh, what is he, 24 years old now or something? Yeah. 23, 24? That's, that's I, a lot of maturity. Yes. I agree with that, and I like having that um, in my defensive backfield. I do. Uh, I it's think a leader, that, you know? Yeah, I think he learned. I do. Um, we saw a different guy this spring there, and let's not forget, it was only a couple years ago in the uh, Big Ten Championship game when he absolutely rocked the Wisconsin quarterback. What was his name? Oh, my gosh, it's name slipped in my mind. Uh, but was it was that, the, uh, the last – was, Grant, was it Mertz? Was it Mertz? It was the last play. Or was it the play? one before that that played uh, it was finished one up in Dame? Yeah, and it was the last play of the game, and he's scrambling on the sideline, and he just put him into the next yeah. universe, man. And Brutus was like, he covered his eyes. That's, I mean, that guy's still in there, man. He's yeah. still in there. Um, yeah, I'm with you. We got one more position. Steve is actually, he's he's almost, uh, he, I see him, so we're going to bring him on in just a minute. Uh, but let's go ahead and finish out this last position on the defensive depth chart here, too deep. Um, the corner slot, I've got Cameron Martinez and then Jahad Carter as his backup. I still haven't heard on how that injury is going for Jahad, but they played Cameron a lot this spring at that position. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I- I'm with you. Um, may- I think he probably – I think the competition was originally closer than this. But I think Jihad, having suffered the injury, gave Cam the snaps. Um, I think he was leading the competition already going in. But at the same time, you know, the the, the defensive backs are just, I think, like you said, it's going to be so good, so competitive. You may be one mistake from your last play as a starter. And that goes across the board. 
I love the depth, man. It's it, we're, we're building up yeah. that depth. And as everybody says, Jim Knowles likes to talk about it. It's a safety driven defense. And so you yes. got, if, if that's the engine that drives your defense, then let's make that engine as strong and as fast as we can. And so that means you're going to need extra parts, man. So yep. I'm all for it. And uh, our listener, J- Jason Monk, remind us it's cone. Is it Jack cone? Jack cone. Jack cone. Yeah. He reminded us of the, of the, of the quarterback from Wisconsin. All right, we're going to take our quick commercial break. When we go back, when we come back, we'll welcome Steve onto the show. Make sure you have your questions ready uh, for former Ohio State quarterback Steve Belisari. So hang tight, everybody. We will be right back. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360 degree high definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And we are back, and there he is. Former Ohio State quarterback Steve Belisari is with us here on the program. Steve, thank you so much, first off, for coming on the OHIO podcast. We truly appreciate this, my friend. I'm glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Steve, first off, let's let's do this. Um, I always like to start with this question because I love to get everybody's kind of background of where they come from and how they ended up at Ohio State. So what's your recruiting story, my man? How did you how did you end up being a, becoming a Buckeye? Yeah, it's a, it's a long story, actually, because, you know, my dad is from Columbus. My mom's from Cleveland. Um, so got some pretty deep Ohio roots. Actually, my dad played for Woody Hayes back in 58 and 59. Um, I ended up moving to Florida and then, you know, obviously my brother got recruited and went to Ohio state and, um, you know, I had the chance being the younger brother of someone playing D one to get a lot of different recruits, right. I had a lot of different coaches come in when he was getting recruited and, you know, obviously he said, Holy, hopefully if you do well, you know, we'll be back. And that was the case. Um, so, you know, got recruited by a lot of different schools we coming out of South Florida, but, uh, you know, always knew about Ohio state, right. Grew up watching it because of my dad and my family. Um, still have a brother, or st- sorry, still have two sisters that live, live in Columbus as well. So, um, you know, Coach Cooper offered me as a junior, and, um, you know, I had the opportunity to really narrow it down to Ohio State and Florida State. And uh, I went where I had a chance to play the most, and obviously that was Ohio State. And that's kind of my story in a nutshell, really quickly. That's great, man. So, so let, let me, <laughs> so you come to Ohio State, I mean, you got the family ties, right? I mean, that's got to be huge. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people around the country maybe don't understand about Ohio State is that, I mean, we're born into this thing. Like, sure. <laughs> this is, it's, it's, it's really in a lot of ways. I, I think Chris's daughter said it best. She goes, You guys are a cult, man. I was like, Yeah, yeah. we really are. <laughs> this is, I, I think that's fair. <laughs> you might as well own it, right? So, yeah. I mean, gosh, I can't imagine being a boy growing up hearing those stories about Woody Hayes. Do you get? Do you have anything good to, to share with the listeners on that? I mean, you know, obviously my dad, you know, he coached high school football and girls softball. And I would say he emulated Woody Hayes quite a bit. Um, and if anything, he was harder on, you know, my brother and I than anyone else. You know, and I think there was a couple different times, especially in baseball, of, you know, me throwing a curveball or doing some kind of bonehead play, my dad coming out and, you know, thumping me in the chest saying, hey, man, you know, get it together. Um, but, you know, he, he was a school of hard knocks, right? He learned a lot from Woody, but, you know, he was a unbelievable coach and, you know, had a lot of people come back and really respect him. The softball field down in Florida is named after him. Um, so he was just a hard-nosed guy that didn't really take any BS, and I think it kind of paid off. If you've noticed, you know, my brother Greg played, you know, obviously at Ohio State myself and then my younger sister, Play softball in college. Now she's a softball coach at the University of Delaware. So all of us were pretty athletic in our own right, and uh, a lot of that had to do with my dad. That's that's cool, man. Yeah, you know, speaking of of different coaching, and this is just let's just throw this question out there to you. How do you think coaching has had to change? I mean, gosh, you look at someone like Woody Hayes, and we laugh and joke and be like, "There's no way he could coach today." And I think that's a true statement. But I mean, gosh, look at how much his players love him. I mean, you said it, they emulate them. I can guarantee you that there's a lot of little league coaches and Colt football coaches who uh, who tried to be Woody Hayes, if you know what I mean, when we were kids growing up. But in general, you know, how has coaching had to change in your mind? 
I mean, it's changed tremendously, right? I don't know if some of the the tactics that my dad potentially used on me uh, would fly today, right? I mean, you look at social media and the amount of just eyes that are on everything, you always have to be on, right? And they've always had to be on, but I think it's just a different level of scrutiny now. Um, and you got to be, you know, aware of that. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just know who's watching you at any given time. And I think if you look at, you know, the psychology of sports, things have changed, right? And I do think there's some old school things that I hope we never get rid of because I think they matter and those values will continue to live on. But uh, those coaches have definitely had a change. I mean, look at across all the sports, right? They're all a little bit different now. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we have a question from listener Larry Daniels here for you. A pretty good question. He says, welcome to the show, Steve. How difficult it was it to balance academics and QB film study and game prep when you were in college? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, that's the key to it, right? You have to learn to balance all of those, make sure you're doing well in school. And that's got to be the priority first. Um, my dad always harped on that, right? You know, being a coach, he, he let me know very clearly that football wasn't going to last forever. Um, so you have to take care of school and make sure that you were doing that. And it's really, it's a full-time job. Um, and if you look at the facilities now, um, they, they give you a lot of reasons to be in the building, studying, working out. They have nutritionists, they have tutors there. So, I mean, they do a really good job of making sure you have the resources to help you out, but you really got to dedicate yourself to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris, you got a question? Yeah. I've been so hooking it up here. That That's okay, Eric. Uh, so, Steve, uh, going back to 2000, you were elected as uh, a captain that season mm -hmm. as a junior. Uh, something that might happen a little more now, but at the time was almost unheard of. I think you were the first one in almost, what, 16 years? I think before you, Pepper Johnson was the yeah. last junior. Um, I mean, tell me a little bit about, about that and, and kind of what you felt being uh, you know, elected by your teammates to, to have that role as a junior yeah i mean obviously extremely honored right and humbled to be able to to be voted that by your peers right and uh i think that goes into you know the work that we put into the off season you know making sure that you're 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 present you're practicing um and that was the same for you know the other guys that i voted for you know that i wanted to be a captain you want to know the guys that were there that you can count on and to me like i said that's probably the biz biggest honor is just being voted on that and, you know and people recognizing that as a junior so i mean i was very humbled and you know proud of, proud of that happening. Uh, what what was your big maybe your favorite moment as Buckeye quarterback? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, you know the the first night game you know against UCLA for me was really special. You know, obviously I didn't start that game, but coming out and playing, uh, you know, you're playing a big time opponent. Uh, they obviously got up early on a big play, and you know that was just that was a really memorable moment going out there and, you know, and just competing and having a, having a great night under the lights. Yeah. All right. So you were a Cooper guy and, mm -hmm. um, what kind of good story can you give me of John Cooper? I, I, I always like, we, we, we asked one a week ago. I'd never knew that Jim Trussell came out in dreadlocks one time. I got that. One, <laughs> <laughs> that, one, that one all of a sudden become pretty famous on this show, but what kind of story can you give me about John Cooper? What's a good one? Yeah, you know, Coach Cooper was, uh, you know, he was a good old boy. He always had great one-liners, um, probably some that aren't appropriate to be repeated out loud here. But, <laughs> you know, the thing that I remember the most about him more than anything is, you know, Fridays was, you know, our walkthrough day, um, typically a lighter day in classes and things like that. And, you know, every Friday he'd come into the facility and find a different player or two and take them over to the, the hospital. And he'd go walk the floors unannounced and go visit with people. Um not a lot of people knew that about Coach Cooper. I mean, he did that every Friday. And just that was something that I thought was pretty special. And you, know, you talk about things that people don't get to see or, or know about. And that was something that he did. And he really enjoyed going to visit people and just, you know, paying back any way he could. So that's one that really stuck out for me more than anything else. That's great. Now, a lot of people might not remember, well, I'm sure they do, but you were a lefty. Yeah. And um, we just recruited and got a commitment from Air Nolan, uh, who is a, a tremendous quarterback from the state of Georgia. His highlight film is just mind blowing. Uh, I don't know how this guy's not ranked higher than what he is, and he's ranked pretty high, but he's a lefty. Um, I was a catcher in baseball, 
and left-handers <laughs> pitchers were always a little bit uh, never really knew where the ball was going to go. Um, what's the difference between it, when it when it comes to quarterback play being a left-hander that maybe your your common or normal watcher of the sport might not realize, or is there a difference? Yeah, there's definitely some nuances that people have to be aware of. You know, for one, the spin of the ball, right? So if you think of deeper throws and tacking down the field, naturally as a lefty, my ball's going to tail off to the left just due to the rotation of it. So as you think of play calling and setting things up and what hash and boundary you're on, there's definitely something that goes into it. But I will say this, I think with today's offenses and how they spread things out, that's starting to become a little bit neutralized, right? I mean, there's so many formations and different ways to attack defenses now based off of the spread. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters too much if you're a lefty or righty. But up front on the offensive line as well, right, you want to make sure the backside is protected, and that's you know normally one of your best players. So that's why you saw in the draft over this past weekend, you know, left tackles are a big commodity, right, because the majority of quarterbacks are right-handed. So there's some little nuances there, but I think the way, you know, we currently do things, I think he's going to step in and be just fine. Good, yeah. Um, you know, the, the quarterback position itself at Ohio State has completely changed. I mean, it's just, it, you know, we had this stigma for all these years that we didn't have, we didn't produce a, a, a NFL, um, I guess, all pro quarterback. And now all of a sudden we've had three get drafted in the first round. Um, you know, you have two currently now there in Justin Fields and now CJ Stroud. Um, but I still feel, and I make this argument all the time with my TTUN friend, who loves to rub that in my face, that when it boils down to it, our quarterbacks in the last 25 years have won more than yours in when it mattered in the game. But as far as the quarterback position, when you played versus now, and then in Ryan Day's offense, would you, would you, how would you fare in that offense? Would it be something tailor made for you? Do you feel like, or would you have been more of an urban guy? You know, good question. I, I think, you know, the, the evolution of the offenses over the time have, have really benefited a guy like myself, right? Just that was a little bit more athletic, able to do some things on the run and then having some design, you know, run pass options. Um, so I definitely think it would have been fun to play in. Um, I also think back to my career, I, I thought we did pretty well. Um, obviously, I'd like to see us win, win some more football games and compete. You know, it's funny, I leave and uh, they go on to win a national title. and I don't think they've lost more than two games, but one season. Right in the last what 22 years, so it's been a pretty impressive run, and it's been that evolution, of kind of the offense of some of the guys have been picking up. So, um, yeah, I would love to, to play in some of these different style offenses. Offenses, and I mean, look at the receiver room. You know, over the last call it 10 years, put out some really talented guys. So it's, it's been fun to watch. Yeah, it, it's that room is absolutely sick. I mean, it's unreal. Uh, I mean, the even the even uh, gosh. This weekend at the draft, they were calling us wide receiver you. Um, sure. All right. So let's, uh, Chris, you get a question ready. I'm going to uh, pose this one from Larry Daniels here for us. He asks another good question here. He says, any favorite player that you hung around with? Are you still in touch with some of your teammates? Yeah. No, still still talk to quite a few. Uh, obviously, still talk to Craig Krenzel. You know, our kids play in some of the same sports leagues, so get to see him pretty regularly. Um, still in contact with Drew Carter. Him and I were roommates. Um, you know, still talk to him pretty regularly. Angelo Chatham's, uh, Joe Cooper, quite quite a few guys. So uh, it's it's a brotherhood, right? And it's fun to see those guys uh, work a lot with Tony Locke and Andy Groom. Um, been a medical device with those guys as well. So yeah, there's quite a few of them that I still talk to and get to see you know on a regular basis. That's that's great, man. All right, Chris, what you got, butter? Well, I'll tell you. I'm I'm sitting here and I'm just kind of reviewing some of some of your games, um, Steve. And statistically, I mean, at, at the time you had some tremendous statistics. Actually, I, I mean, I'm looking back at your your specifically your Iowa game where you had three fifteen and three touchdowns. But I mean, as you look at the way the game has changed, um, and Eric mentioned a little bit of how you would fare in the offense now. But, I mean, just how do you think the X's and O's of the game have changed uh, over the last, say, 10, 20 years? Yeah, I mean, you look at what New England Patriots specifically have done over the last however many years when they were winning all those Super Bowls, they became masters at setting up matchups, right? 
And in the NFL, that's really hard to achieve. And then as you look to college and, you know, the advent of the spread offense and how everyone is lining up and creating these mismatches, right? And this is where Ohio State has been so highly effective. If you got to pick your poison, right? Who are you going to guard? you got to have people that can move, guard in space. Um, so it's really put a lot of pressure because from top to bottom, if you do have a weak spot, these offenses are set up to exploit it, right? A lot of these passing games are much like running, right? They're quick touches, get the ball out into the, you know, your playmaker's hands. So I think that evolution has really challenged defense to put more playmakers at every position. And if you think back to, you know, when I was playing, you weren't in the spread that often. Uh, Purdue probably did it the most. And look at how successful they were, right? They were great at finding those matchups. And, I mean, I remember one game against Purdue, I think their tight end had but close to 15 catches because they had something they was working and they could exploit it based off the formation, right? They knew what they were going to get. That's what you've seen today in, in most of these offenses. And the people that can put people in the right position and win those one-on-one -on -one battles do really well. The hardest hit you ever took was from who? Jeez. <laughs> uh, well, there's a couple. Um, the one against Penn State in 99, LeVar Arrington on the sideline, Definitely clotheslined me, which in today's football, I think they probably would have tried to eject them. Um, but actually, the worst one was against Purdue. I ended up changing the position or changing the protection, and I forgot to grab my back and pull them over. So the defensive end had a free run, knocked one of my contacts out, and a bit through my tongue. Um, yeah, by today's standards, they probably would have taken my helmet and not let me go back in the game. But I uh, ended up finishing that game, and I think we did pretty well. So, On that note, Steve Belisari, the rules have changed for quarterbacks. Are you for it or you think they're a bunch of pansies? Uh, I think it's gone too far, right? The pendulum has swung to a point where the rules are very inconsistent. I think it's probably the biggest problem um, because you'll see some guys, you know, get hit square in the chest and not, not have anything called. And you get other guys that get looked at the wrong way and they're throwing a the flag. So I'd like to see a little bit more consistency out of the rest first because there is there is none right now when it comes to that top to bottom. But uh, it's definitely changed quite a bit. Yeah, I I imagine, you know, I've always wanted to ask a quarterback this question. Like when you watch this game, are you like, are you kidding me? When I played, I, you know, he they go in the spiel. So I imagine when you watch a game, sometimes you just shake your head. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's why I laugh. I always tell everyone they were like, what was it like to play quarterback at Ohio State? I'm like, just. Google LeVar Arrington highlights, and you'll see a couple of the plays of what it was like. Just running around trying to make sure I didn't get killed out there. So, <laughs> All right. Hey, so what are you doing today, Steve? Yeah, so I'm in a medical device sales. So I work for a company called Intuitive Surgical. Um, you know, I sold the Da Vinci robot for a little bit, but now most recently I'm uh, working with a product called Ion that does navigational bronchoscopy to help detect lung cancer. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. How long it's a really, been? it's an unbelievably cool device. And uh, what's pretty unique about the company I'm at now is I think they make unbelievable products, but we work with some of the best physicians and surgeons in the world. And what they're able to do with this technology is it's pretty impressive. It's very fun. It's a very rewarding job and makes it easy to get out of bed every day. That's great, man. That's so cool, dude. Um, we have another question from a Facebook user who said, Steve, what advice would you give a young high school athlete who is looking to further his or her athletic career in college? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot that goes into that. But I think in today's environment with social media is being able to have the ability to not listen to the noise. Um, there's always going to be someone that has an opinion or a comment nowadays, which was different. You know, when I was going through this, um, I didn't have Twitter. I didn't have different accounts. I just had fans, right. Or people that would potentially maybe know me or you know, recognize me. Uh, now that has completely changed, right. And everyone has an opinion. Everyone can go out and make a comment. And if you're good enough to play at that next level, you got to believe in that and turn off the noise. Um, there's probably a hundred other things that I could say, but right now with today's environment, listen to the right people and don't worry about the rest of the comments, right? Go out and just play hard, control what you can control. Yeah. I mean, look at us, Chris and I, years ago, we would have had to, you know, gone to radio school or whatever. And right. We, we've had our different paths and, you know, to get to where we are and, and hosting this show. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're just, we're just two fans with a microphone, you know, and, 
and here we are talking to a former Buckeye. So that's pretty cool. So, but I agree, you know, the, the, the thing it, it's so disheartening to me as a fan to watch the overreaction that takes place after a loss from sure. the fan base. I mean, yeah, there are things that I'm sure all of us would look back and be like hindsight's 2020. I wish they would have, you know, ran a different play here or, you know, player wouldn't have slipped and fallen here or they would have thrown the flag on this play. But my gosh, some of the people, and I just call them drunk fans, you know, the two percenters <laughs> who just absolutely, they'll, they'll, what they say on social media, they would never say in public to someone. Sure. You know, they're just keyboard warriors. But that that part, that aspect of, of this isn't changing anytime soon. And so, no. you know, you, you bring up a very good point, Steve, with that. But on that note, <laughs> As a as a former player, and then as a fan, I assume you're still watching the games and enjoying Ohio State football. What's it like as a former player to now have to like be like, like us? We're fans. Like it's you know, d- is there a part of you who still is like, man, I have the itch, you know? No, I I, I really enjoy being a fan. Um, okay. And I, I love the style of football that we're playing. You know, I, I made the comment earlier, but you know, I left and they got infinitely better, right? I mean, think about it. We've not had many loss, many lost seasons and the amount of talent and players that have come here, I'm, I'm proud of it. And it's fun to watch. Um, you know, I had my moments, so I don't have that itch. If there's anything, I, I, I miss the, I miss the two a days, right? I miss the, the crummy parts of, of the football, right? And that's, that's the stuff that I probably miss the most, but I just enjoy going to games being a fan now. I think it's great. Yeah. When you go to fans, do you, how many autographs do you sign? Oh, it, it's pretty rare. Every once in a while, uh, I get some, but you know, it's crazy to think, but it's been over 20 years since uh, my last game at Ohio State. So really? I, think, I think people uh, are, are yeah. moved on, which is not a bad thing. Hey, Eric, uh, I would just like to note that I am someone who does happen to have a Steve Belisari autograph. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. Nice. <laughs> All right. So who was your mentor while you were there at Ohio State? Jeez, uh, there's a lot. I mean, you know, coming in as a freshman, I, Joe Germain was great to me and helped me a ton. Um, but I have a huge advantage in a brother who was five years older, right, who played um, played at a high level, was in the NFL, um, then came back and was a graduate assistant. So, you know, my brother's always been one of my bigger mentors, um, you know, someone that's always been there to help me. So was my dad. Um but yeah, I mean, th- those are probably the two that stick out the most that have helped me out along the way. And, you know, I've had a ton of great coaches, um, you know, Coach Daniels, uh, who, you know, unfortunately passed away not too long ago, was just an unbelievable mentor and coach as well when I was there. So I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really good people around. Yeah. So uh, we're going to wrap this up here in just a few more minutes. Chris, do you have any last questions before I get to my famous last question? Yeah, just really quick. Uh, Steve, did, did you happen to catch the the NFL draft this past week? I did. I did. So what was kind of your thoughts as you saw some of these guys, you know, sliding down the board, board a little bit who I really feel like we should have had some guys a little bit higher up there, uh, specifically, you know, our our tackle and uh, Dewan Jones and uh, our center Luke, Luke Whippler. Luke Whippler. Um, and Ronnie Hickman, who a few years ago was just a tackling machine, who's only, uh, I think, was penalized because we had two linebackers step up and play tremendous last year. Sure. Uh, so what did you think about the way the draft kind of played out for the Buckeyes? Uh, I would say this. Overall, the draft has become something very different than, than it's been in probably the last 15, 20 years. The amount of people that get drafted off of combine stuff is it's kind of weird to me. Um, cause game film trumps all, right. And that's kind of to your point, right. I think we have some guys that might've slept a little bit because they didn't have great pro days or things like that, but then you go put on the film and at the end of the day, when you look at the draft, you know, the first two to three rounds are basically who's going to get paid and how they're going to get paid. And that's the whole point of the combat, right? They're going to minutely pick all these different things. And then after that, you are drafting for fit and talent. Um, and I look at Hickman as a great example. I think he probably, if I'm a coach and I don't, am I going to take a pick on a safety that I know I could probably get, you know, as an undrafted free agent. So it's changed the dynamic quite a bit. Um, so I think it played out kind of how I expected in some respects, unfortunately, because a lot of it's heavily weighted on pro days and 
combines when I, I think it should be the other way around. But um, I'm the one guy. I'm on a podcast with you right now. I'm not playing in the NFL or coaching. So what do I know? <laughs> But but you were drafted to the NFL. So. I was. I was. At the position I didn't even play, right? right? So, I mean, again, that goes back to pro days and combines. And, you know, they took a shot on a guy because I had some good pro day stats and moved me to safety, right? And, it, you know, it didn't really pan out. But, uh, you know, that's just the way I think the NFL is on their scouting. And, you know, that's the crazy part about, you know, I look at the last week and a half for C.J. Stroud. That was all posturing to try to reduce yeah. the amount of money he could make in a contract, right? Uh, whether any of it's true or not is irrelevant at this point, but it's pretty interesting to watch how that has become it's kind of a game more than anything else. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It really is. Well, listen, Steve, we, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and joining us this Sunday evening. And, and I really want you to know that I appreciate that, but I always end with this question when I have the opportunity to talk to somebody, and that is this. What does it mean to you, Steve Belisari, to be a Buckeye? Yeah, that's uh, the, it's a deep question for me because of the family ties, right? It is like one word that really, I mean, family, right? And more than anything else, I look at my dad who played for Woody, my brother, I have sisters that have gone there. Um, and then the the friendships and the, you know the brothers that I played with, it is family, right? And I look at some of my fondest memories as a fan are watching my brother play, right? Um, you asked the question earlier, what was my favorite memory as a Buckeye? And I had to pick one of me playing, but it was going to the Rose Bowl in '96 and watching my brother and that team win, oh, yes. right? So it's just, yeah. yeah, family is the one word I could use to describe it, right? It's hard to it's hard to actually put it in the words or verbalize it, but it means a lot. Me. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up one of my favorite games all time. My cousin's Ryan Miller. And, uh, I was, I was a youngster then. And, uh, that was the night that I, I got baptized in the scarlet and gray. I fell in love that night. I absolutely yeah. fell. And I've, it's no go. It's, it's, it's been every game, you know, I still get teary eyed when you walk into the stadium, you walk, you know, and you just, all the ghosts of all the Buckeyes past, man. It's just to be a feel a part of that, man. It, you, I think you summed it up well. It's family. It sure. really is. And I think that's why we all hurt so bad when we when we lose that last game in November because it's like our whole it's like a family reunion that hurts, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> no doubt. So, but hey, listen, I really appreciate you coming on with us, Steve, man. I I I, I want you to know that and. Uh, you got a you got a big fan in Chris and I and, and all of us here at the OHIO podcast, but it's that time. I gotta go put kids in bed and, and I gotta get ready for work myself tomorrow. So remember everybody, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH and sing Carmen Ohio with all your heart until next time. OH. I owe. I owe. Go Bucks. <laughs>